Physics Notes, Unit 20, Electric Current and Power. The word current here is very similar to what we would use to refer to the current in a river, water flowing through a river. We're going to be using a lot of analogies here, at least one major analogy. But for example, electric current is the flow of electrons through wires. It, it could be protons, but usually it's not protons because protons are stuck in the nucleus. Electrons are loose, and those are the things that are responsible for currents and wires. And the current is caused by a potential difference, a voltage, delta V. The potential difference is what's is, is kind of like the pump in a water system pushing electrons. But before I get into the details too much here, let me show you an analogy, or let me show you a video that met, might help us think about these concepts and terms. So here we have one of the most basic circuits you can have. This is a battery, then these brown lines are wires and we have a basic light bulb. Now in this analogy or simulation which I'm using the University of Colorado FET simulation circuit construction kit direct current. We'll talk more about that later on what direct current means. But these little blue balls are electrons. And what's happening is they're moving around in the circuit. That's the flow of charge, the electrons. And as they go through the light bulb there's friction there. We call that resistance. We'll define that in a little bit here as well. And then the light bulb gives off light. So it's a conversion of electrical energy to light energy. Now, a couple things here. This is a complete circuit. The electrons are flowing. One thing is, one of the questions is going to be, where do electrons come from that are in a circuit? One of the misconceptions is the battery supplies the electrons. No. The battery down here is not supplying the electrons. There are some electrons, if I, let me, okay, yeah, so I just opened that switch right there. So now we have what's called an open circuit and the electrons stop flowing. So I said, where do the electrons come from? Well, there's some electrons in the battery. There's probably millions of them, but there's millions everywhere else as well, billions, right? But when you open the circuit, they're stop, they stop where they're at. They're all, they fill the circuit, they fill the wires. There's copper in these wires and other elements, but every copper, atom has a bunch of electrons and there's some loose ones and those are the ones that basically move in this pathway around this circuit. I kind of liken it a little bit to like musical chairs. If you've ever played the game musical chairs, but here there's a chair for every electron. There's no missing chairs. In, in the game of musical chairs you always have one, you pull one chair out and somebody doesn't get to sit down. But here when you stop the music, in other words you open the circuit, the electrons all stop where they're at and they just kind of like orbit the nucleus where they're at right now they don't stop dead, they stop and they don't move forward anymore. Okay, so that's called an open circuit. But the electrons are in all the elements and then I'm going to close the switch, that's called closing a switch, and now the circuit is active again, the electrons flow. So the flow of the electrons, the flow of charge is called current. All right, now a couple things and this, this, this light bulb, if I click on it, it has what's called resistance. That's kind of like the analogy in a mechanical system to friction. And that friction in this light bulb causes heat and light. There's other ways to cause light, but that's one way. Now, I can, down here, I just clicked on that light bulb. I can increase the resistance of that light bulb down at the bottom here. Right now, the, the units for resistance are ohms. You don't need to know that. I'll spell this out in the notes but I can increase the resistance of that light bulb. And what happens is it makes it harder for the electrons to go through that light bulb. And it slows down the whole flow of the current. All right. And then since there's less current through the light bulb, it's less bright. We call that the power of the light bulb. The, the power of the light bulb can be easily observed by how bright it is. We're also going to calculate that. All right. So let me calc uh, if I keep increasing the resistance, increasing the resistance, we make it turn it way up. I slow down the electrons. They're still moving, but there's very little flow of electrons, very low current when we have a high resistance. That makes a lot of sense to most of us. If I now decrease the current, uh, the resistance, I'm sliding the bottom here. So now, okay, I'm going to go back. That's almost the original. I'm going to keep res um, lowering the resistance, and as I lower resistance. There's more and more flow of electrons. And now the light bulb's getting brighter and brighter, more power. And watch what happens if I lower the resistance too much. Well, I'll do that later. Hold on to your thoughts with that. I'm going to do that at the end. I'm going to lower it so much 
some interesting things happen when you get some very, very low resistance. But some other things here, I'll go back to about the original, I don't know, I think the original is 10 ohms. Okay. Now, if I click on the battery, the battery has what we call a potential difference, voltage. Technically, it's delta V. This is a 9 volt battery here. All right. Now, if I increase the voltage, the pressure, so to speak, okay, there we go. Now there's more flow and there's more brightness, more power in the light bulb. The current increased, the voltage increased. That's going to be called Ohm's Law. When you increase the voltage, you increase the current. Once again, this will all be written down. If I decrease the voltage, I get less current, less flow. So those are some relationships. I'll go back to about the, well, the original is like 9 volts. One other thing here is that in a battery, and we don't want to have to draw the diagrams like this. We'll have what are called schematic diagrams. I hinted at that in Unit 19. Um, in, a, in a diagram like this, the convention for this particular website is this dark side here is the negative side and the brown side is the, the positive side. And literally the electrons are pushed from the negative side around. The battery is the push, okay? It's what's supplying the energy to push the electrons. But they're all flowing at the same time, like, like musical chairs when the music is on. Now, the weird thing is, because before they really realized what electrons were, back in the days of Benjamin Franklin and so forth, when they first started studying circuits and defining things, it's more conventional to talk about positive flow. So this won't be a problem once we get rolling, but right now it might be a little bit of a challenge to think about this. A negative moving to the left is the same as a positive moving to the right. So the convention in almost every book, in almost every textbook, including ours and including the way I do it, is we say the current is flowing the other way, counterclockwise. The electrons are flowing literally in this circuit counterclockwise if this is the negative part of the battery. I could switch this battery around, put the negative part over there, which would change everything. You know, the electrons would go the other way. But literally, when we say that we would say in this circuit that the current, the conventional current is flowing counterclockwise from the positive this way to the right, up here, through the bulb, around. Okay, so an individual electron would be doing that. So all of the electrons, well, not electrons, protons would be doing that. If, if they were protons, which is what they originally thought they were, they didn't know. We, we can't see these things inside the wires anyway. But conventional flow, we say, is the other way. It's a little hard at the beginning, but eventually it really doesn't matter much because a positive moving one way is equivalent to a negative moving the other way. We'll talk more about that. But there we go, a basic circuit with the flow of charge being the current. All right, back to the specifics of the notes here. So the electric current is the flow of the charge. Like I say, usually the electrons, because of the potential difference, the voltage pushing them. There must be a complete circuit. There must be a complete circuit, a complete looping path. Over here, for example, this is a little bit different diagram of that same thing you just saw. By the way, with these old, these little light bulbs like this, you have to have one wire touching the bottom because inside this light bulb, basically, there's a wire that goes straight up and then it's attached to the actual filament. They're usually made of tungsten, which is part of the path, and it comes down, and then the, the second part of that wire once you go through the filament, is attached to the side of the bulb. So the second wire has to be touching the side of the bulb. But in this case, in the first diagram right here, there's an open circuit because that red wire is not touching the battery. But once you touch it, you have a circuit. Now the light gives off light, right, because the electrons are flowing. The electrons are flowing the opposite of these arrows, but this is the conventional current flow. I'm going to go back down here to the right. Conventional current flow is from positive to negative, down here on the lower right. That's what every basically every book assumes. The, the simulation didn't. It showed the actual electrons, but conventional current flow, positive and negative. All right, but we don't want to draw our diagrams. We don't, we do, it's just too much work to draw a battery and a light bulb every time. So here we have what's called a schematic. This is the diagram we'd like to draw. This is the one that electrical engineers or people who have to work with this or study this, it's just a very simplistic or easier way to look at this and it's understood. You have your battery, and in general, there's resistors of every kind, things that offer resistance to the flow, in this case, the light bulb. But there's other things. Even wires themselves offer some resistance. More on that to come. And the units for resistance are ohms, this omega. We'll define that, like I say, in a few minutes. Now, the water analogy, which I alluded to earlier. 
a pump, a pump is like a battery. A, a water pump does not supply the water. A battery does not supply the electrons. It pushes the electrons. It's the energy that pushes the electrons, gives them electrical energy, motion, basically, into, well, eventually kinetic energy, the move. The pipes, the pipes in a water analogy are like the wires, or in other words, the wires in an electrical system are like the pipes in a water system. The, the, the wires allow the flow of the electrons and water, the pipes allow for the flow of the water. And in, in a pipe, a clog is like the resistance. Makes it difficult for the water to get through. So as you saw in the simulation, if you increase the resistance, the, the, water, the, the flow of the electrons is slowed down, less current flows. All right, so other things that I've kind of mentioned, where do the electrons, where do the flowing electrons come from? From the wires and the other elements. From the light bulb. There are some in the battery, but they're in every element. And there's other elements that we're going to have in, in circuits besides light bulbs and batteries. All right, so the electrons don't come from the battery. The battery pushes the electrons. It's what gives them energy. All right, so now for some of the particular quantifiable calculations. The mathematical definition of electric current. Okay, it's current over here is the charge flow per unit of time. But mathematically, symbolically, it's over here in this circle. We use the letter I for current, not the letter C. We've already used that a couple times for a couple other things, for capacitance, for coulombs. It's already been overused. And you got to be careful with the letter I because it can look like a 1. But I is... Delta Q, change in current or current that moves over a given amount of time. So the units for current are coulombs per second. And we call a coulomb per second an ampere or an amp. You've probably heard of that before. So let's practice that. If 27 coulombs of charge pass a fixed location in two minutes, what is the current? Well, I'm just going to use that, that equation. I equals 27 is good. 27 coulombs. We want coulombs. In two minutes, well, we got to convert that to seconds. I think we can do that in our head, 120 seconds, because it's 60 seconds in a minute. So it's just 27 divided by 120. That comes out to be 0.15 coulombs per second. You could call that an amp if you want. I just want to iterate that a coulomb, that's a, that's a coulomb per second. Or like I say, you could just say 0.15 amps. Same answer. All right? Simple. If the current is 3 amps, how many electrons pass a fixed point? This one's a, a double step problem. But you start off with the same equation, but now we know the current 3.0 equals Q, delta Q, but a lot of times we drop the delta in the equation. The time is 10 minutes, which is 600 seconds. So always have this in the proper units. The 3 amps, good. So Q, the charge flowing, pass a fixed spot. In other words, if you were stationary in one, in one wire and you were watching electrons go past you or the current flow past you, in a river it would be like gallons per second or gallons per minute. Here it's like, um, it, it says 3 coulombs per second. So how many uh, electrons pass you or how, many, how much charge passes you? Well, it's, it's 1,800, 1,800 coulombs. I'll write it out. Right, you could just put capital C there, but I'm being a little bit careful with the units right now. So 1,800 coulombs past that spot. That's not my answer, though, because it says how many electrons pass that spot. Well, 1,800 coulombs of charge, to figure out the electrons going back to that unit, electrostatics, which I believe was unit 8, 17 or 18. Unit 18, I believe. 1,800 coulombs divided by... 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs per electron. So how many electrons does it take to make 1,800 coulombs? A lot. It takes a lot. 1.1 times 10 to the 22nd, 10 to the 22nd electrons. That's not really a unit. That's a number. It's how many electrons go past you. So if you were sitting in the corner of this wire for 10 minutes, you'd have that many electrons go past you. Or, or protons it would be that many protons because they're the same charge. But it's electrons. That's a lot of electrons. All right. Uh, one other con concept here, or another concept, is DC. You've heard this before. 
You've probably heard of ACDC. It's a band back from the 70s. That's where they got their name basically from. There's a lot of names and things that come from electric terminology. Tesla. Well, that comes from magnetism. We'll talk about that in the next unit. Or two units from now. This is 20... 20, unit 22 we'll talk about magnetism but direct current current that flows only in one direction any any circuit with a battery which is what basically we're going to restrict ourselves to for the most part that's the simulation I showed you it was all the current was going clockwise I could switch the battery around then everything would be going counterclockwise but steadily the, the current flows in one direction if you open it up it stops flowing like musical chairs when you stop the music but when you turn it back on it flows in that same direction if you don't alternate, alternate, if you don't mess with the battery. But then we have alternating current. That's the common household outlets. The current changes direction at a fixed frequency. Basically outlets, all outlets in your house are alternating current. The, the electrons go forward, then backwards, then forward, then backwards, then forward, then backwards. Their net progress is zero. They end up going nowhere. So it's pretty boring for those electrons in an alternating current circuit all they're doing is vibrating forward and backwards but they're delivering energy in in the united states our standard outlets are 120 volts 60 hertz but you go to other countries it's similar well a lot of other countries have like voltages that are double ours like for example most most of the outlets in europe are 230 volts 50 hertz slightly less frequency uh, of alternation but double pretty much double the voltage and a lot of countries have higher voltages, like China, 220 volts, 50 hertz. That's why when you go to these countries and you have electrical appliances like hair dryers and so forth, you have to have an adapter to convert to the proper voltage and frequency. It turns out, and this will come up later, but one of the reasons why we like alternating current is because it's easy to transform it from one voltage to another for reasons we'll talk about later. But you don't need to know that now. Basically, you just need to know that there's direct current and alternating current. Direct current, it's pretty obvious. Current that just goes in one direction with a battery. And current that alternates forward and backwards. We'll talk more about that later. Now, a couple other concepts. You have what's called drift velocity. It's the net average forward velocity of an electron in a DC circuit. Now the electrons are moving very fast. They're orbiting, but they also are jumping from orbit, you know, from one orbit to another orbit. They're making progress. But this particular diagram here is from the book. Kind of shows you what when it, when a circuit is active, when it's turned on, and the battery is pushing the electrons. They don't just keep moving forward. They're they're kind of doing all kinds of random motion. So that this electron here is going up, down, this way, that way, up. Uh, so it's it's going all kinds of zigzag, but it's making net progress forward. So at the end of this particular scenario, which might be two seconds or whatever, the electron is going to end up over here. It's moving very fast in each of these pathways, but its net forward progress is very slow, actually. That's called the drift velocity. That's V sub D up here. The, the, forward, the net forward progress is like, up, it says it right here, but it's roughly most wires when it's turned on and active. And it, can, it varies depending on you know, what your current is, but it's in the 1 times 10 to negative 5th meters per second, which is like 0 0.01 millimeters per second. They don't make much progress. It's very slow. Even though the actual speed of the electrons in the millions of, you know, could be a million meters per second. Each of these, you know, they're, they're traveling at a million meters per second. It's very fast. Like, you know, um, could be, you know, two million miles per hour. But their net forward progress, very little. Now, the electrical signal, when you turn on a circuit, once again, thinking about that circuit that I did at the very beginning, the circuit, the, the signal, you know, like when you, when you flip a switch to turn on a light, it comes on almost immediately. Even though it might take an electron that was near the battery, it might take it three, four, five, or ten minutes to get from the battery to the, to the light bulb. Actually, probably longer than that. That electron takes a long time to get that light bulb. But what turns on the light bulb? Well, it's the electrons that are by that light bulb already. And that signal is transmitted near the speed of light not the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, but the signal transmits because when you, once you turn it on, it's again, it's kind of like musical chairs, but almost all those electrons almost instantaneously all start moving, and the ones in the light bulb start moving, turning the light bulb on. So there's a lot of different ideas you got to think about here. There's the actual speed of the electrons and you know, lines, and they might not even be linear. They, they're doing some orbiting as well. 
which is in the millions of meters per second, but their drift average forward progress is very slow. The signal, once again, is transmitted near the speed of light. Okay, so almost all the elements in the circuit are affected immediately once you turn it, turn it on and close the switch. All right, so you have this idea of electrical resistance, which is the, basically it's like the analogy to friction in a mechanical system. A light bulb is a type of resistor, but in a, a circuit like with uh, electronics, like a computer or other device, and in a in a phone and things, they're they're integrated. They're really they're not even like this. But if you open up a computer, or even at the back of a TV, like even a flat screen TV, you'll see some of these devices. They're like most of them are like little brown cylinders. These are really small. This is probably this one here is probably about the length of a dime. Well, not even that. This is probably the size of a. This one might be the size of a dime, like you know a coin. So these are really small. Uh, these wires here that are attached to them are, you know, like kind of like paper clips. Like this would be the size of a paper clip. All right. So most resistors, okay, have little. They're like little cans, and most of these have like little have carbon or something in them. You don't need to know that, but almost everything has resistance. Light bulbs has resi have resistance. I'm not going to have you identify resistors, but I just want you to know that these are in a circuit. If you open up and you see these things, they are things that that cause electrons to slow down and that you can you can uh, calculate or they're they're measured or they're rated by their the color of the stripes tells you if, if you read them you can decode them by their color of the stripes tells you what their rating is for how much resistance they have different colors have different resistance sizes here are some just little comparisons of things that have resistance like down here on the left hand side is our uh, objects that have low resistance Gold, gold is one of the lowest resistors, resistances. Once again, most of what we're going to be doing is not these little colored resistors up here, these striped resistors. We're going to be doing just wires. So we're going to focus on wires, not those little canisters up here. Just want you to be aware that those are resistors in, a, in an electrical device. We'll, get, we'll focus on wires. Most wires are not made of gold because that's too too expensive. But copper is almost as good a resistor. So to the far left is you know good resistance. Gold is a better resistor than copper. Copper is a better uh, resist well, has lower resistance. Better use for wires because they have low resistance. They don't slow down the, the electrons uh, like like iron might. And copper, but copper is more expensive than iron. But iron does not it does not make good wires for other reasons. And then there's nichrome and graphic uh, graphite. You're not going to need to memorize this. You can refer to this table if we need it. Seawater, which you don't use for wires, but it has <clears throat> salt water is less resistive. That's why when your body is wet, you have less, re less resistance and you have there's more danger of electrical shock, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Rubber tends to be in this middle range. Surprisingly, you'd think it'd be a little higher. Pure water is actually a good insulator. It doesn't have as much resistance. as It has more resistance than rubber. So if you go to the right, you have more and more resistance. These things can slow down electrical flow, but you don't use most of these in, in wires because wires are made of metal, but glass. So sometimes you want insulators. So these would be considered insulators. They're not good conductors. These are good conductors, the opposite of an insulator, which we went over in unit 18. All right, so if you need to use that table, you'll have it as a reference. All right, so here's probably the central, one of the central ideas that connects the three big concepts here. The three big concepts are resistance, current, and voltage. We have what's called Ohm's Law, named after a famous scientist back in, the, I don't know if he lived in the 1800s. Current in a wire is directly proportional to the voltage applied. So here, here's the idea. The, the more the voltage, the more the current. And I, and I kind of showed you that in the simulation. When I increase the battery voltage, you get more current flow. And literally, the equation is delta V equals IR. The voltage of the battery, or the voltage source, if it's some other source other than a battery, equals the current times the resistance. The current's in amps. The resistance is measured in ohms. The symbol for ohms, I like to write the word out, but there's the symbol. It's like the Greek letter omega. So we need to get used to this. It's a pretty straightforward problem, Ohm's law. Ohm's law is really I is proportional to delta V, but usually we refer to the equation here as Ohm's law. And we drop the delta almost always. I have it in there right now. 
but most books, your book included, and myself included, as we go along here, we'll start dropping the delta, it's assumed. So when you read these problems, part of it's vocabulary. There's prepositional phrases. Whenever you see the word of, it's usually talking about a resistor. You'll see that in the, the example problems I'm going to do here in a minute. You talk about the current going through things, the current flows. We say the current flows through the elements of the circuit. And the voltage is impressed across. It's applied across an element. So we'll practice this. But it starts off real easy again. What is the resistance of a light bulb that draws 2.5 amps of current when connected to a 124 volt source? It doesn't say current, but that's implied. It's current, 2.5 amps. Okay, so when the current through the bulb is 2.5 amps. So this is what a simple application of V equals IR. So I'm just going to plug in the V equals IR. And I left off the V there. It says V is one or the delta. I left off the delta. So 2.5 times R. So this is pretty easy. So 120 divided by 2.5, that's 48 ohms. And you can use the omega symbol instead of just writing out the word ohms. So... There we go, Ohm's law. Or number four, what is the current through an eight, 18 ohm device at 50 ohms, 50 volts? So once again, I'm just going to plug in the V equals IR. So we have 50. So given any two of these, you can calculate the third one pretty easily. So we're looking for the current here. Make sure we have the proper units, 18 ohms. So I, the current here, comes out to be 2.8 amps. You can just use capital A for amps. I like to write them out just so we are very sure on the units here for now. All right. So to summarize the first half of unit 20, in a simple circuit, you have to have a complete pathway for the flow of charge, typically electrons. The flow of the charge per unit of time is called current, measured in amps. The current everywhere is the same in a single looping pathway. It's like the flow of water in a river or in pipes, but this is in coulombs per second. Resistance are elements, any element, but some have a lot more resistance than others, like light bulbs typically have a fair amount of resistance. Something that slows down the flow of the charge, restricts that flow of charge. And then the voltage is basically the energy source. Once again, a volt is a joule per coulomb. It's the energy, the source that's pushing the electrons, not supplying the electrons or the charge. It's the push for the electrons, and they're related by... Ohm's law, which is delta V equals IR.